This is our ancient testimony, Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that my, I may also go and pay him homage. When they, heard, when they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure, treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Thanks, Nancy. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So the ancient scriptures work a lot like, well, they're like an old barn uh, built long ago. Um, back when it was built, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, the barn may have functioned uh, very well, been strong and protected people from gale forth winds and kept people out of the cold and uh, both people and animals both and life could thrive with that barn but you know it's been 2,000 years since the last piece of that scripture was uh, written and well we're 2,000 years removed from those stories and we assume in modern times we just can translate quite easily but we are so far removed from that world that it's really hard to understand some of the metaphors that come up. It's, you know, bear in mind that 2,000 years ago, even 200 years ago, the world was lit only by fire. I mean, just that one fact alone should remind us that um, a whole lot could be assumed in a world that looks like ours, but actually is quite different. And so the, the stories sound quite different. Well, the, Chris, the Christmas story is one of those stories. It's like, uh, it's been, it's part of an old barn that, and of course, a lot of people think the barn is now obsolete because so many accretions and ways of, we don't understand the metaphors, we understand them differently, so they don't speak to us like before. So some people think we ought to just bulldoze the barn or tear it down or burn it. Uh, but if we would actually take a, a plank and, and examine it carefully, we could discover um, some real beauty in that, especially when we learn to hear it as the ancients would have. And so this morning, we're going to take a plank off that, that barn, uh, namely the, the story of the, the Magi. And we're going to examine it a little cl more closely, starting with the story about the stars. And so I'm going to invite you to take a look at a few stars in the Northern Hemisphere. And of course, we in the modern world, we're, especially in a city like Portland, we are so um, immersed in the uh, in in light, even at night, that that you know when we see the stars, we just kind of think of them, them as being stationary. They're just there um, if we see them at all. Uh, but of course, in the ancient times, when before the world was lit by lights and was lit only by fire, um, we see a very different picture. Uh, people examined uh, the stars and they saw them moving. And of course, that wasn't because the stars were moving. It's because the earth is moving. They thought the stars were moving. We now it's, know it's because of us. Our movement creates that, that direct now. now listen to these tones. These tones are actually generated by an iPhone application that's 
no longer available, unfortunately, but it's called Astrocantus. And Astrocantus takes the GPS coordinates from the phone. It puts a line, an imaginary line right above you, and then assigns a tone to each star that passes above you according to its level of brightness. So Astrocantus has just translated the stars that were above this person on that particular day into music. Literally the music of the heavens. Now, the Magi, I mean, the story is not, we think about like the stars moving is the big surprise in the story of the Magi, but the Magi would have realized that happens all the time. It's the fact that the star would stop. You know, that's what you know, would have really caught their attention. They were astrologers. They studied the stars and they knew that stars always move, but then there was this one that stopped. And it's the stories, we have to believe that the stars actually stopped to affirm that the story is trying to tell us, pay attention to the story and pay attention like the ancients would have paid attention to it. The ancients paid attention to the heavens because they thought they were symbols of how the divine was working in our world. They told us stories about the different energies that were entering and influencing us in different ways. You don't have to believe in astrology, but at least listen to this story the way the ancients would have. Heavens were like the ancient television, constantly watching the story chain, the story of God's will and intent for us and our lives. So the fact that the story stopped at Jesus' birth told the Magi, whoa, this is a particularly important story. It's meant to tell us that. that. Uh, it's a particularly interesting story. But imagine the story is changing over time. You can hear now the book of Ecclesiastes, for everything there's a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, and so forth. You might also hear Martin Luther King Jr.'s words, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And in the ancient understanding, things change. God changes. God bends the universe, the sto our story, more toward justice towards love and light. Not that God changes, but the context here on earth always changes. And therefore, the application of God's will. It's so interesting how in the modern world, we want to freeze tradition. Like we say, well, you know, let's restore some time in the past when we felt especially close to God. Or I really miss the Jesus I learned when I was in Sunday school, or I miss an earlier era, or couldn't we just step back to the first century and be just like that? The ancients would have thought that was crazy because they knew that God, God's story is always on the move. Humanity is on the move. That's the difference between being a, a, a living tradition and merely being a traditionalist. A traditionalist wants to stop the story cold and leave it there forever. But one who follows a living tradition follows the way of the tradition to acknowledge that things change and change with those times. The number one lesson of the Magi is the very one that animated Congregationalist John Robinson when the pilgrim set out from Holland for America, when he said, For I am very confident the Lord hath more truth and light to break forth out of God's holy word. In other words, God is on the move in order to break open that which is not fully in line with God's love and justice. He brings more truth and light into the world and into our own lives. And this works for our lives, too. Sometimes God has to break us open, or at least allow the world to, in order that we can contain more light. This pandemic was kind of like the star stopping momentarily. Everything got disrupted. And in the stillness brought about by this disruption, we're invited to take a deeper look at our lives and our society. Not saying the pandemic was sent by God, uh, but as the Magi would say, well, Never lose an opportunity to look around you when the world stops in its tracks and ask, what am I being invited to really see? 
around me? What is the new story that is breaking into our world? What part of God's about the story is God inviting me into? Isn't it amazing how an old tattered story that seemed so useless and irrelevant, like an old piece of barn wood, can still speak deeply to our world? of it just the worst time of the year for a journey and such a long journey the way is deep and the weather sharp the very dead of winter and the camels galled sore-footed refractory lying down in the melting snow there were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes the terraces and the silken girls bringing sherbet 
Then the camel men, cursing and grumbling, and running away and wanting their liquor and women, and the night fires going out, and the lack of shelters, and the cities hostile, and the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches, with the voices singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn we came down to a temperate valley, wet below the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a water mill beating the darkness, and three trees on the low sky, and an old white horse galloped away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel, six hands at an open door dicing for pieces of silver and feet kicking the empty wineskins. But there was no information, and so we continued and arrived at evening, not a moment too soon finding the place. It was, you may say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago. I remember, and I would do it again, but set down this, set down this, where we led all that way for birth or death, there was a birth, certainly, we had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. That was actually the very first poem that T.S. Eliot ever read over the radio to the United States. And, uh, I find that poem fascinating, a fascinating contemplation on the story of the, the Magi. Um, and incidentally, before we go on, uh, hold up your fingers if you, know, if you know how many Magi there were, or wise men, how, how many were there? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of threes, and I see some people not holding up fingers. And it, those of you who are not holding up fingers, I'm assuming you have the wisdom that the Bible doesn't mention, actually, how many magi there were. Um, we assume three just because there were three gifts. But there could have been 300 magi. I mean, we don't, we don't know. But it's because of the gifts they bring. And T.S. Eliot noticed something uh, about those gifts that is quite ancient, that really um, has been lost largely on us in the, the modern world. And, and in order to get us to see it, he had to take the plank off the barn and put it into an entirely different context that's quite modern. And then we see some of the old grain of this story. Uh, he noticed the myrrh, the ancient significance of myrrh. Uh, part of that is that it was, it, it was it cleansed, it was used to actually uh, kill bacteria. They didn't know about bacteria, but they did know about disease and myrrh was seen to have, was seen to have uh, helped with that, but it was therefore used for also cleansing uh, or uh, anointing dead bodies to keep the rot from uh, happening so much. And so the myrrh was, was always, you know, part of it was a symbol of, of death. Now, we, we are aware, we, we see in the Christ story, oftentimes you hear people writing about how myrrh you know, was a foreshadowing of Christ's death. But what's so fascinating to me is that T.S. Eliot noticed that it's not just Christ's death uh, that's being signaled in the story about myrrh. The significance of Christ's coming has not simply to do with his death, but our own. And I don't mean like death in the final sense. I mean, death of an old story that we've, we've clung to too long, an old story created by an old dominion that, that has nothing to do with bringing us fully alive in this world, a, an old story and an old dominion that is far too s small for us to possibly live inside in freedom. No, he knew that the, 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 the story is trying to tell us that the coming of the Christ is meant to expand our story, bust them open, break open the old story and announce a new one. And in this sense, also myrrh stands for the prophetic witness of Jesus. It's labeling Jesus as a prophet. He's announcing the, 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 the bygone age and the coming now of the new one. And what does that new age look like? 
Well, it looks like, as we've uh, observed before, uh, the opening words out of his mouth of teaching in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark. Friends, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is already here. Change your whole way of thinking and believe the good news. Another way of putting that would be, friends, we are all loved, all of us, without exception, beyond your wildest imagination. So change the story of your life to increasingly reflect this reality, not the one you've been living under. There's still another way to hear that story if we just move over to another religion entirely, uh, but related to Christianity, uh, that of Islam and the, the Sufi mystic uh, Rumi. You may be familiar with this line from Ruby, Rumi that I think picks up well what Jesus himself was trying to, to teach us. Oops, just a second. Got to get on the right screen here, sorry. Here we are. Right. Okay, sorry for the faltering around here. Still getting used to the live Zoom worship. Here we are. Oh, well, never mind, Rumi. <laughs> I'll tell you what Rumi said. <laughs> How's that? Uh, Rumi said this out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. Out beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. No, Rumi knew about this new dominion that had broken into the world, one that is out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, where we are not defined by how good we are or how evil we are. We are defined by something else entirely. We are defined by the fact that we are human. It's not how bad or good, it's that you are human. And as human beings, you and I are created in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, there is a core in us that is always right with the world, right with reality, right with love. And that cannot be taken away. And therefore, we are loved beyond our wildest imagination, not simply because we are good, because certainly we are more than just good. We are also not good. We are loved beyond our wildest imagination because God is good. And God has created us. So that's what the myrrh represents, a death of that old story that says some of us are loved and others of us aren't. Or the story that says you can only be loved if you earn your way to God's uh, love. But then there's that other gift, uh, the gold. The, the Magi start with the gold. What does gold signify in the ancient times? Well, certainly gold signified a lot, but the major thing gold signified, and certainly what the one the story is trying to point us to is, is kingship. And gold has long been associated with kingship. In fact, there's, a, there's an ancient um, inscription uh, from the Assyrians of, of King Jehu of Israel bowing down before uh, Shalmaneser, who is the Assyrian lord, and, he, and the inscription lists all of the offerings that that he brought uh, to Shalmaneser. And let's see if I can get this one up on our screen here. Um, oh, I still don't see that, do you? Oh, actually, maybe I'm just not seeing that. You might, I think you are seeing it. Are you seeing Jehu bowing? Okay, so there's Jehu bowing. And the inscription says that uh, he not only brought uh, gold, we brought gold ingots, a golden bowl, a golden vase, golden tumblers, and golden buckets. <laughs> you get the impression that Jehu wanted to make a good impression on his new and powerful overlord. And uh, he knew that the slightest sign of disloyalty on Israel's part would lead to a swift and devastating destruction. So he gave gold to signify his loyalty, that 
Shalmaneser was the ult his ultimate authority. He brought gold to signify this, literally buckets of gold. So, but what would kingship represent according to the new dominion? That's kingship according to the, the old dominion. Well, I think what this the story is trying to signify is that we no longer have permission to bow down to the authorities of the, that old dominion that, that says some are my favored ones and others are not. Uh, those who are disloyal are executed and those who are loyal to, to me are, are not. No, the story, the story is trying to in invite us not to bow down to any story, but the story that affirms that you and all people are loved beyond our wildest imagination and then invites and invites us into that story to expand our own love that we receive and give to others. We have no permission to bow to any other ruler than the one that says, hey, I'll meet you in a field out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing. This is the new field in which we are to stand. Not necessarily because it came to birth uh, when Jesus did, but Jesus reveals the, a, a field that has always been there and allows us the ability to trust that field. And we should really kind of see ourselves, um, well, I think you know, if we're going to, to follow that, that, that idea of authority, the, the, to me, the image that speaks to that is actually uh, from a piece of an old barn wood that I found at uh, Salvage Works in Portland the other day when I visited that shop. And I'm gonna to try to share my screen now to show you that, that particular piece of wood. There we go. When I look at, look at these pieces of wood, all come from old, old barns and uh, Took a look, took a look at that top one. To me, that represents how God sees us and how we should see us. There's, you know, if, if the world looks at us, that only sees the outside ex exterior marks, the way that the world has wounded us, and also perhaps the wounds that we have incurred by wounding others as well. And the world only sees those imperfections and sees that, uh, you know, these lives, these imperfect lives, if they get too imperfect, they're just worthy for the trash heap or the the garbage dump or the, the burning pile. But what God sees is something quite different. We are created in God's very image and likeness. And so at our core, there is that godliness in all humanity. And from that core, every layer upon every layer of year by year of life is affected by that core. And so though the exterior could be quite marked up and quite ugly in the eyes of some, there is always beauty there to be seen. We are meant, ultimately, uh, to be seen this way, to seeing people this way ourselves. And just like that old barnwood, we recognize that it's not all about that inner perfection. I mean, that beauty of that, that cutaway piece is, is certainly very, very beautiful. But when you put it into conversation with all those pock marks and dents and love marks, all of that wood, just the whole piece speaks. It's, it's no longer about what's imperfect and what's perfect, right? This wood invites us to stand in that field out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing and simply be and simply see the beauty in us and in others, even imperfections and all. And so that's the only authority we, have to, we are allowed to bow down to as those who follow the Christ is, is the authority of a God who sees us this way. So what is frankincense? represent. Well, I'm just going to leave this photograph up as I just mentioned a couple of things about frankincense. Frankincense, of course, is incense, and, but it was very special incense in Israel's um, understanding. Uh, frankincense was only burned to represent the happy times between us and God. In fact, you were specifically forbidden to burn frankincense as a sin offering when you came to the, the temple or the tabernacle. Frankincense was burned inside the Holy of Holies, the very holiest place where God was thought to be invisibly enthroned above the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, frankincense was really, to, to smell frankincense was a representation of just how close God is to you and I. And just how even amidst, even amidst all of our flaws, 
you know, if we can smell the frankincense, we know that God is just as close as this and inviting us into just as happy relationship as this frankincense um, smells. And what frankincense te teaches us, I think, is that not only should we, uh, do we no longer bow to any authority that does not recognize that we are loved beyond our wildest imagination, we and all people, and inviting us to change our lives according to that reality, but we should also not honor any religion that doesn't see us this way as well. This frankincense represents the priesthood of Christ. Therefore, the religion of a new dominion. Not to say that Christianity is the only religion of this new dominion, but we are here because we found this new dominion in the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, the story of the Magi teaches us that, is trying to tell us that Christ, the coming of Christ, uh, that he is our prophet, announcing the old death of the old dominion and, the, and the, the presence of the new one. He is our king, or the, the revelation is. In, in other words, we no longer have to bow down to those powers that do not see the beauty of our humanity, even amidst our imperfections. And he's also our priest, who invites us to step away from any religion that does not see people as God sees people. Just like this old timber from the old barn. Doesn't mean we're totally perfect. Doesn't mean we're totally flawed. What it means is that we are meant to step inside of God's own house, imperfections and all, and dwell there in a place beyond the ideas of, of right doing and wrong doing, where even the notions of each other has become so mixed as to become fundamentally irrelevant. Any separation between us and each other, or even God. That's the house that the Magi invite us to step into, in Christ's name, amen.